There has been a recent spate of solid war movies that have shown the futility of war through the eyes of the common soldier. Nothing to do with overarching war aims and logistics, or 6th Army moving 20 kilometers outside of Paris while the sun shone hot on French rifles and German panzers, but through the eyes of the young people who felt that great fear and sense of duty. But filtered through a 21st century that saw their superheroes crawl through grit and low contrast to grunt and rage against what? What is the mirror held up to society when we watch a ninth rebooted Batman movie? No hate on Batman, by the way. I love those movies, too. It's just every generation views war movies in their own way. And the 21st century war movies are gritty, yes, but also, I feel, seeking to honor actual human experiences rather than give catharsis to society like war films of old. My grandfather died this last spring. My girlfriend's grandfather is 96 and saw the tail end of the war in the Pacific. The people who had memories of that time and of that war are now leaving us. Is that why we want to preserve their prism of the war, their experiences, with the realist sense of a common soldier? We watch the documentaries about the leaders who organized and orchestrated the war, but the movies are about the soldier and their journeys. If you haven't seen David Ayer's 2014 film Fury, you should. And I'll throw in last year's All Quiet on the Western Front in that, too. The Netflix one, the German rendition. Whew, solid, solid movie. But David Ayer, he's actually an interesting guy. He was a submarine sonar tech for the United States Navy before writing the screenplay for U-571. It's another badass war film. It's a little light on historical accuracy, but still good. But Fury is about an American tank crew as they punch their way into Germany from the West in the late stage of the war, 44-45. Brad Pitt is First Sergeant Don War Daddy Collier, and he commands the M4 Sherman tank. And if you didn't know about the M4 Shermans, they're the highly modifiable, maneuverable, mass-produced tank of the Allies. And I've actually got a quote here from the museum that housed the Sherman tank in the film. A2 indicates that the vehicle is fitted with the General Motors 6046 12-cylinder twin inline engine. E8 means it is fitted with the horizontal volute spring suspension, and nicknamed the Easy 8 suspension, armed with a long 76mm gun, and fitted with wet ammunition stowage. The main armament ammunition was stored in boxes with a fluid jacket to prevent fires. I mean, just think about that. You're in the safety and security of a tank. Because mainly the tanks are supporting infantry. It's not like Kursk every day of the war. So there's infantrymen getting shot outside the tank. You know, rifle rounds pinging across the armor. And you're in the safety and security. But then one round hits the ammunition stowage. And, you know, fluid jacket or not, it goes up. And what was once the safety and security of the tank is now a burning coffin. I can't imagine a worse way to go. The beautiful thing about the Shermans was their highly modifiable, maneuverable aspect. Not so beautiful for the Germans. Because the Germans are essentially fighting a different war on the Eastern Front. Most of their armaments and material and resources are being funneled to the Eastern Front. You know, the vast Russian steppes. So they're favoring heavy armor and big guns. And that's just not, you know, that doesn't, it's not cutting it on the Western Front. Described by one GI the size of telephone poles. The film actually features the last working Tiger tank, which is pretty interesting too. But as interesting as tanks are, there was one thing that really impacted me in the film, and that was the spotlight on how war devastates men's souls. And I think you see that most in Shia's character, Bible. Uh, and I'm not, not going to talk too much about his... You know, what people may have heard on set, his pulling a tooth to get in character for the film, or fist fighting with Scott Eastman for spitting tobacco juice on the tank. Just strictly his character in the movie. Although, with Shia, you know, maybe they're not that inseparable. Shia actually said, and this is a quote from him after the movie, I found God during Fury. I became a Christian man, 
and not in a fucking bullshit way, in a very real way. I could have just said the prayers that were on the page, but it's a full-blown exchange of heart, a surrender of control. And I said, here am I. Send me. But what I found really fascinating was what beat the men down time and time again. And it wasn't so much the, the war fighting with their counterpart German soldiers. It was the 10-year-old shooting a Panzerfaust, fighting kids, and going down the line shooting horses that decimated their psyches. It's like you go to war expecting one kind of hell. But it's the small accumulation of unexpected events is what actually puts you there. Screaming on mute. It makes me think of a few lines from Virgil's Aeneid, another war-torn epic from thousands of years ago. I guess it shows you... Dawn rose, spreading her pitying light, and with it bringing back to sight the labors of sad mortality, what men have done, and what has been done to them and what they must do to more. You see that? That's an entire city on fire. It's kind of hard to mourn when everything is continuously ongoing. Like, you get a cut, and then you go to sleep, and it heals a little, and then the next day, you get cut again. And the next day, cut again. The next hour, the next minute. It's a wound that is consistently being torn open. And the men in the film are walking open wounds. There's just no way to square that. There's no way to heal when something is ongoing. And I think the film does a very, very impactful and great job showing that. But the one scene that stuck out to me is showing a desolation, and it doesn't even happen. It's just hinted at, and that's more terrifying, I feel. When they're in the captured German village, and Don and Norman are in the apartment with the, the two German women hiding, and they're having their scene, and Norman has his, uh, his tender, tender love with Emma. But you know outside is the rest of the tank crew. And you know the unpredictability of them, especially John Barenthal's Grady character. And you're just waiting for them to bust in. And then when they do, the tension just, you could cut it with a battle knife. It's so thick. Because, I mean, let's do the math. You got two women, plus men who are tired, broken down. They could die in five minutes. They're in enemy territory. They just don't care anymore. And that plus that, that is an equation for spiritual desolation. Because what could be more spiritually desolating than taking the freedom of another? And it's only saved by the duty of a mission and Don's, a sliver of Don's authority, keeping them in check. Because, I mean, Grady says it. What's going to happen is going to happen. Happen, happen. What's going to happen is going to happen. Sitting here playing house, a couple of bitch crowds ain't gonna change a fucking thing. Shut the fuck up. That horror that follows war around like a fifth horseman. There's actually a very interesting quote from none other than Joseph Stalin at the end of the war when the Soviets are racing in to capture the crown jewel of the dying Nazi empire, Berlin. And the generals are coming to him and they're saying, Oh my God, the, the men are just, you know, animals. They're just, you know, going through. It's like a wildfire. They're burning through. They're just assaulting women left and right, you know, from young to old. And Stalin actually says this, and I quote, You have, of course, read Dostoevsky. Do you see what a complicated thing is a man's soul, man's psyche? Well then, imagine a man who's fought from Stalingrad to Belgrade over thousands of kilometers of his own devastated land, across the dead bodies of his comrades and dearest ones. 
How could such a man react normally? And what is so awful of having fun with a woman after such horrors? You've imagined the Red Army to be ideal. And it is not ideal. Nor can it be. The important thing is that it fights Germans. The rest doesn't matter. Anytime somebody goes to war, it's like they go to war against humanity itself. It's scary. It's terrifying. There's no glory in it. And I think movies like Fury and All Quiet on the Western Front are are really encapsulating that more than, you know, the, the glorifying war movies of the past. Uh, let me know if you liked Fury. And if you didn't, you know, what are your favorite war films? Doesn't have to be, you know, recent ones can be older ones. But uh, from the bottom of my heart, thank you for watching. If you find this content engaging and you want to see more videos, please hit that like and subscribe. And see you next time.